constantly been surprised. Whoa. When we look at the internet and where it came from and where it's arrived today and where it's headed, I think it's quite clear that the engineers didn't really realize just how much this was going to change things. People thought we were crazy. The internet thing is never going to be as important as the telephone or the television. In this series, we'll journey through the past, present, and future of that revolution we call the internet. We'll go inside the hidden places, practices, and people who make it hum and ask, why do we all love it so much? This is the internet, really right here. We usually think of it as invisible, up somewhere in the cloud. But this is where the invisible becomes visible, where the intangible becomes concrete. I'm Derek Muller, and I'm in an internet exchange point, one of hundreds of places around the world where computers, networks all link up to form the global internet. What's happening in here is that countless routers and switches are receiving data from one network and they're passing it over to another network via real physical cables. So it's a network of networks, all interconnected, which is why we call it the internet. And here you can actually reach out and physically touch it. Everything we've ever recorded, or for that matter, ever written, texted, or tumblered, passes through these global internet exchange points. It is a cosmic journey, the likes of which neither Newton, Tesla, nor Einstein could ever have fathomed. All of it traveling at the speed of light. I spend most of my working life here on the internet. Now, I know that may sound a little bit nerdy, but I actually really enjoy it. I create and host an online science channel called Veritasium, meaning the element of truth. It is my dream job because I'm passionate about science and now I can investigate topics I have always wondered about. Isn't that cool? And bring my world of science to a massive international audience. Whoa. I capitalize on the reach of the web. For example, after uploading this video called The Surprising Application of the Magnus Effect. Oh, look at that go! <laughs> It has now been viewed by more than 50 million people from around the world. Not bad for a film about a fluid dynamical effect. As a species, we have an inbuilt need to connect with others, to communicate and share our stories, to create community in essence. And the internet empowers us to do that in ways we never before imagined. In 1969, the same year that a man stepped on the moon, Leonard Kleinrock headed up a team of computer scientists later hailed as the fathers of the internet. And it all started in a room like this one. But the interesting thing is that if none of us had been born, we'd still have an internet today. It was in the air, it was going to happen. The inspiration to create a brand new network came from a branch of the Defense Department called ARPA the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Well, you know, ARPA was formed as a response to the 1957 Sputnik launch by the Russians. The Soviets had caught us with our pants down. We were behind in technology. At the time, computers were very large, very expensive, and separated by great distances. So a single user wishing to use multiple programs would have to travel to different locations. Computers need to talk to each other, and there was no way in which they were able to do so efficiently at the time. Here was the problem. If you were trying to send files or messages over a network, you'd have to put them in one at a time. So each message had to wait its turn. And if one of the messages were really big, it would take a long time to go through. The solution Leonard Kleinrock and his fellow internet pioneers came up with still lies at the heart of the internet today. It's called packet switching, in which all the messages are cut up into pieces of the same size, called packets. 
then the packets can travel separately through the network, making the best use of every available space. So packets from small messages, well, they can squeeze into the gaps between packets from large messages, avoiding the long wait. And once those packets have reached their destination, they can be reassembled into their original messages. To do all that chopping and reassembling, a special device would connect computers to the network. This is the very first piece of internet equipment ever. This is where the internet began. It's the interface message processor. It's made out of a military hardened machine for the Department of Defense. Inside, you notice, it is so ugly, it's beautiful. It's my friend, has a unique odor, and it's really old equipment, but this is where the entire internet began, right here. The year is 1969. Richard Nixon is inaugurated as our 37th president, and more than a million people gathered at Woodstock to celebrate sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And on October 29th, Kleinrock's team at UCLA logged into a computer at the Stanford Research Institute. Now, to make sure this worked, because this was the first time these two host computers were going to talk to each other, to let somebody log in remotely, we had a telephone connection, just to be sure. Now, to log in, you have to type L-O-G. So, Charlie types the L, and he says to Bill, you get the L? Bill says, got the L. Type the O, you get the O? Got the O. Type the G, crash. The system went down. The first message ever on the internet was low, as in, lo and behold. Samuel Morse had a good message on the Telegraph Network. He said, what hath God wrought? He prepared a message. He had the press and the media there. Alexander Graham Bell, telephone. Come here. Come here, Watson, I need you. Neil Armstrong, giant leap for mankind. But it turns out that the message we sent was about as short, as prophetic, as powerful as you can imagine, low, by accident. Our vision in those early days was machine to machine or person to machine. What I missed totally was that this was not about computers talking to each other. It was about people communicating with each other. By the end of 1969, there were just a few computers connected to the ARPANET. But the network grew steadily during the 1970s. But as they multiplied, it became more difficult for them to integrate into a worldwide system, and the desire for access to each other's data was enormous. Back in the 1970s, there was no single global internet as we know it today. Instead, there were lots of different networks, like the government's big ARPANET, and satellite networks, and little community operations. But they all had their own different format, and they connected to each other in different ways. So in short, if you weren't already on a network, there was no way to get to it. It was like the biblical tower of Babel. We needed a common language, a standard set of protocols that would allow all these networks to talk to each other. The internet got the common language it needed thanks to two pioneering scientists and this nondescript delivery van. Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn worked for years to solve the problem of connectivity. Bob showed up in my office at Stanford in 73 and says, we have a problem. You know, my reaction is, what do you mean, we? And he says, well, I'm trying to get these nets to interconnect, and I don't know how we should do that. Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn outfitted this vehicle with high-end computer hardware and radio transmission gear, and then they drove it through the streets of the Bay Area. On November 22nd, 1977, the team at this console was able to transmit a message to Los Angeles, 400 miles to the south. But they used three networks to do it. The two men developed a way for all the computer networks to communicate. It's been described as the handshake that introduces computers to each other. They also came up with a new word for what they were doing. Bob Kahn and I wrote this first paper describing a protocol for packet network intercommunication. And so internetworking was uh, the term that was used, but it was so clumsy. Bob Kahn called the project internetting, 
and eventually we started to refer to the object that we were building as the Internet. Computers were still large, roughly the size of industrial refrigeration units. The only people who could afford them were large corporations, universities, and the military. But as they were manufactured to be smaller and smaller, personal computers began to take off, and so did the internet for the user at home. Probably 1981, uh, I bought a PC and tried to get hooked up to a modem, and it was really complicated, really difficult. But there still was something magical about the idea that I was you know, sitting at a computer connecting with people uh, and ideas all over the world. The standard speed of connection was 56 kilobits per second. So uploading a video or even a photo took a ridiculously long time. People were complaining. It was too slow. And we're going to fix that with the cable modem. Jim Phillips was an executive at Motorola in the mid-1990s when they developed a way to speed things up. Now we looked at all these cable companies, and they had this uh, way of communicating via hybrid fiber coax. Back in, the, in those days, they called it TV wire. What that gave us was really high-speed data, which we hadn't experienced before. And the best part, no more phone lines. Suddenly, you could download audio. You could download video, even. <laughs> Once you were connected, you could also join discussion groups and send email. One dial-up service rose to the top. AOL, America Online. Welcome. You've got mail. It took millions of Americans online for the first time. The mission of AOL in the early days was to create a service that was easy to use, useful, fun, and affordable. Uh, but the broader mission and sort of the real mandate that was driving us, we really believed the Internet could be as important in people's lives as the, the telephone or the television, but even provide more value. To attract new customers, AOL used a brilliant marketing strategy. Honey! The new AOL disc is here. Remember those CDs? AOL just gave them away so people could load up the software and connect to the network. Millions signed up. At one point in the 1990s, half of all the CDs produced on Earth were from AOL. And users discovered new ways to find each other. For us, the community was everything. It was how, how do we create a whole suite of tools? So it started with email, it also was message boards and forums, things like that. But we also thought the real-time communication was important. So initially we launched people connections, sort of chat rooms, then we created instant messaging. AOL provided a gathering place for groups of people with shared interests. They could see all the traffic of so many communities coming online, so whether it was iVillage with women, or Blackberry Creek with young children, or Net Noir, the African-American community, LGBT community with Planet Out. I used to call it the two-thirds rule. More than two-thirds of their traffic was people just talking to each other in their platforms, in a chat room, message board, etc. I used to even joke that I'm kind of like not just the CEO of the company, I'm kind of the mayor of the community. We asked a question in 2004 of a, of a lot of experts. What is the most surprising thing about the growth of the Internet? And they said the spread of the web itself was what stunned them, just that so many people had so much to say. And, of course, there's a lot of cat videos in that and a lot of cat pictures. Kittens, inspired by kittens! But there's also sort of profound sharing. My shirt matches the boxes behind me. I'm going to change. Yeah, I think that's better, although I wonder if we can take it down a button. No. One of the most famous to upload his life is John Green. John's best-selling novel, The Fault in Our Stars, became a hit movie. But millions feel like they know him personally because for years he's run a YouTube channel. You're very, very tall. <laughs> yeah, I know, and very white in this picture. Including this one, which is enormously popular with his brother Hank. My eye. From January 1st to December 31st, 2007, John Green and his brother Hank ran a video blog project they called Brotherhood 2.0. Every day for the entire year, the brothers sent each other videos. Don't you know the whole world's already gone and reserved a copy at Amazon? How many more books could you sell? I got to hang out with John, and we reached out to Hank. Yeah. And good, good morning, morning, Hank. Hank. It's, it's Thursday. Oh, dang it. <laughs> All right. One more time. Yeah, one, two, three.
most famous to upload his life is John Green. John's best-selling novel, The Fault in Our Stars, became a hit movie. But millions feel like they know him personally because for years he's run a YouTube channel. You're very, very tall. <laughs> yeah, I know, and very white in this picture. Including this one, which is enormously popular with his brother Hank. My eye. From January 1st to December 31st, 2007, John Green and his brother Hank ran a video blog project they called Brotherhood 2.0. Every day for the entire year, the brothers sent each other videos. Don't you know the whole world's already gone and reserved a copy at Amazon? How many more books could you sell? I got to hang out with John, and we reached out to Hank. And good, good morning, morning Hank. Hank. It's, it's Thursday, Tuesday. May oh, 5th. <laughs> All right. One more time. Yeah, one, two, three. Good, good morning, morning, Hank. It's Thursday, May 5th. May 5th. It's, it's your birthday. birthday. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Cool. All right. I am uh, rolling. We're rolling on sound. You, see that? Yeah. you like that? Great. All right. Okay. So tell me how you decided to put your first video on YouTube. So late in 2006, my brother and I were talking on AOL Instant Messenger, and <laughs> um, uh, we were talking about how we never saw each other, and we never talked on the phone. Uh, we only communicated textually. And we got this idea over Instant Messenger to stop communicating textually and only to communicate via videos that we made back and forth to each other every day. That was early. That was early days. Did you realize what you were doing at that point? I no. Mean, what was no. your expectation for the project? I remember when Hank uploaded the first video and a couple days later we had 450 viewers. I remember thinking, where did these 450 people come from? It just felt huge to me. It, it, it was astonishing that you could reach people so directly. Off topic, but at the state fair, turkey legs are just so delicious. I wonder if Velociraptor legs are good. Morning, Hank. It's Tuesday. Today's video is like nothing you ever bought at Ikea. It comes to you in only two parts. Part the Green Brothers' daily vlogs began to gather a massive audience, and theirs was one of the first big channels on YouTube, leading the way to the birth of a YouTube nation. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Buongiorno. I love you. I mean, watch my channel. The brothers also set off a relay race of memorable virtual moments. By the end of the song. Sedan. Oh, Johnny, that really hurts. Yes, we can. Double rainbow. What does this mean? Hi, guys. Um, so this is my first video blog. Once the term social media was created. Hmm. I guess I'll just do this. There was clarity that we were living in a world where the internet was of the people. By the people well, hi everybody. and for the people. We are working hard to make this an awesome year for other people. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. Get to it. The year was 2014. Ebola was in the news daily, and nearly 3 billion people were now on the internet. At that time, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge was traveling the web at warp speed. We are taking the Ice Bucket Challenge from Daffy. <laughs> the online campaign went a little something like this. I am accepting the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Either you or someone you knew poured a cold bucket of water over your head. You then made a donation to the ALS organization and also nominated someone else to then pour a bucket of water over their head. Ice bucket challenge. I accept the challenge. Challenge accepted. The viral campaign was an effort to eradicate Lou Gehrig's disease. It also may have underscored the look at me and narcissistic culture that had begun to emerge online. More than two million people posted videos of themselves accepting the challenge. The Ice Bucket Challenge raised more than $115 million in just six weeks. It was, and still is, the apex of using social media for a cause. Every month, almost 2 billion people log on to Facebook. 
Its founder, Mark Zuckerberg, grew impatient with the creation of an official Harvard webpage while he was a student, and so he and his friends decided to take matters into their own hands. Zuckerberg launched Face Smash for Harvard students only, and from there it spread to other colleges, and then on February 4, 2004, the site The Facebook was launched nationally. Just four years later, the company was valued at nearly $4 billion. It's already hard to remember life before it, when we actually smiled at someone when we liked something, and tagging was just a kid's game. The online platform shifted our communication from emailing to broadcasting the content of our lives. And even if it went away tomorrow, it has forever changed the way we communicate. Facebook continued to experiment with the ways users could webcast. So when Facebook Live appeared, it enabled users to go live with whatever they were doing from wherever they were doing it with the push of a button. And through it, we've had front row seats to everything. OK, here we go. <laughs> From the viral sensation of Chewbacca Mom to the other extreme, the live cast of the Minnesota shooting. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my god, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Where Diamond Reynolds broadcasts the aftermath of the shooting of her partner. He was just getting his license and registration, sir. The internet via Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and so many more sites has become our go-to for just about everything. Breaking news, social movements, or a funny moment to break up an otherwise horrible day. I saw the life inside of your eyes tonight. These statistics show us in real time the sheer enormity of web activity at any moment in the day. It is now true that every second, 6,000 tweets are tweeted and 41,000 status updates are posted to Facebook. And Google processes 100 billion searches a month. I think it's fact. I don't think it's, I don't put a judgment on it. I think we're heading towards a world where everything is being imaged. I have to teach my four-year-old kids now that if they do something and it's viewed on Facebook, it's there forever. So ultimately, it's going to change society. Audience participation made the internet enormously powerful, but its reach accelerated with the juggernaut of online gaming. It's nearly a $100 billion worldwide industry. Four out of five households in the United States have gaming consoles, translating into 155 million Americans playing games regularly. All right, Koopa Troopa, game on. Game on, Veritasium. Am I saying that right, Veritasium? For some, it is a full-time job. They play online and others pay to watch. I went one-on-one -on -one with game streamer Josh Peters, who goes by Koopa Troopa 787. Ugh, I hate that. He's definitely out of my league. Tell me about the journey from, you know, doing gaming for fun to doing gaming for a living. After a week of doing it, without even trying to monetize or make money from it, within a week of starting, I was making more money than I was at my full-time job. For the first time in my life, I felt like I could actually do something that I really enjoyed, but make a living out of it. And I know sometimes I take that for granted. It's a very, very big question, but I mean, do you feel like the internet has made a life possible for you that, that was otherwise impossible, or what are your thoughts on it? I have had up to 57,000 people at once watching me play a phone game, and there's no, I mean, that's an entire stadium's worth of people watching me play a game on my tablet from my home office. And that's, that's not possible without, without the internet. Let's see here. All right, he's dead. He's fallen to the ground. Now I'm going to try talking to the little kid again. And he has no idea where most of these people are watching him from or who they are. The audience lurks in the shadows. His fan base is completely anonymous. Capitalizing on the invisibility of anonymity, apps like Whisper and Secret and Yik Yak began to saturate the marketplace. Yik Yak was created by college friends Tyler Droll and Brooks Buffington. 
They wanted to create a more democratic social media network where users didn't need a large number of followers to have a virtual voice. So they allowed people to post comments completely anonymously. Yik Yak's 1.8 million faceless users share thousands of yaks per day. It started out, innocently enough, with postings like, Shout out to the girl in the red sweater on the library steps, looking real good. I hate when my phone says searching, but when it does, I hold it to my heart and whisper, me too, phone, me too. Good morning, Savannah. Well, the smartphone app, Yik Yak, only launched last December, but how quickly it took off. Yik Yak targets college students, but the younger crowd is using it too. And it can also be dangerous. It's called Yik Yak. But the tide quickly changed to cringeworthy and, of course, horribly offensive messages, or yaks, as they are known. Female students at the University of Mary Washington were threatened verbally with rape and other kinds of abuse. Crime alert out of Fredericksburg, where police say a man has been arrested for the murder of his college roommate. One of them was actually murdered. Her friends and family say it was partly due to the tension that began on the app. In Falls Church, the funeral for Grace Mann is being held. There were incidents at dozens of colleges and universities. Yikak's founders say that they have made changes to address the complaints they received, like adding filters to flag offensive language. They have also built geofences around roughly 85% of the nation's high schools and middle schools. Total anonymity gives you freedom perhaps to speak or to explore different thoughts, ideas, uh, you know, possibilities that might be out of the bounds of perhaps your normal social milieu or your physical setting or whatever. But how do you balance the need for our an anonymity in, in very real situations, the political dissident, the uh, abused spouse, et cetera, versus the growing trend of, of just intolerant speech online? As social media connects more people than ever before, its success depends on companies policing their sites so that racists, criminals, and bullies do not make their presence known. The really, like, mean-spirited things that people say is just mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Content moderators like Alex Trum patrol the cyber frontier. Their full-time job is to remove offensive material from social networking sites. For content moderators like Alex, it's a grim workday, and the burnout rate is high. You say something offensive to someone online, you can't see their physical reaction in their face. You can't see how hurt they feel. So there's no human aspect to it, and you feel like you can kind of just, there's no consequences for your actions. It desensitizes us. When we go online, we're not looking at each other, and empathy is born in the gaze, in the eye contact, in the face. Sherry Turkle has spent the last 30 years studying the psychology of people's relationships with technology. There's been a 40% drop among young people, among college students, in the capacity for empathy um, in the last 20 years, with most of the change taking place in the past 10. Content moderation requires a human touch. No amount of programming or algorithms can do this work, especially when it comes to imagery. A lot of the images that come through are sexually explicit, sometimes sexually violent, or very gruesome. The constant stream of troubling words and pictures takes a toll. On average, moderators last somewhere between three and six months before quitting. Some have even reportedly developed post-traumatic stress disorder. You leave work at the end of the day feeling a little down, a little depressed, you know, kind of lose your faith and humanity a, a little bit. My mantra for moderators is moderate in moderation. If you're doing it all day, every day, uh, whether it's images or content or videos or anything else, you'll feel like the whole, your whole world is negativity. This business is often kept in the shadows intentionally. The large companies who hire content moderators don't advertise that reportedly half of their workforce is doing this type of work. They don't want the public to know that there's actually a huge need to police their sites. Most people don't know that there's this whole other side to the internet where there are people working really hard to prevent you from seeing some of the more negative things that get posted online, which there are a lot of. I don't think we'll ever get rid of kind of the dark corners of the internet where the seedy people go to do what they'll always do. 
I think it's inevitable and it's just part of human nature and it's going to be a part of the internet as long as the internet is around. Some governments have also taken action to gain control of the web. Take China, for example. They've built what's known as the Great Firewall. It's a sophisticated system of filters that blocks out anything the Chinese government deems undesirable. So if you're in China and you search for persecution, you'll get a blank screen that says page not available. You get the same kind of results if you search for Tibetan independence or democracy movements. And you know, websites like the New York Times, Time Magazine, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and most of Google are also blocked. There's no denying that someone's always watching you. They also are implementing highly controversial surveillance, which they call the Golden Shield Project, using speech and face recognition, closed circuit television, and other internet surveillance technologies. The Chinese government hopes to create a gigantic online database of each and every one of its citizens. And several years ago, China insisted that Yahoo turn over account information that ended up helping the government track and imprison <laughs> It's a sophisticated system of filters that blocks out anything the Chinese government deems undesirable. So if you're in China and you search for persecution, you'll get a blank screen that says page not available. You get the same kind of results if you search for Tibetan independence or democracy movements. And you know, websites like the New York Times, Time Magazine, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and most of Google are also blocked. There's no denying that someone's always watching you. They also are implementing highly controversial surveillance, which they call the Golden Shield Project, using speech and face recognition, closed circuit television, and other internet surveillance technologies. The Chinese government hopes to create a gigantic online database of each and every one of its citizens. And several years ago, China insisted that Yahoo turn over account information that ended up helping the government track and imprison journalists two of which were then sentenced to 10 years in prison. The incident attracted so much attention that Congress held a hearing where an outraged congressman told Yahoo executives, While technologically and financially you are giants, morally you are pygmies. Yahoo has since apologized for the incident. Censorship has gone global. France and Germany have laws banning Nazi propaganda. And in Australia, there have been a series of proposed laws to block pirated materials and protect children. Now, those are worthy goals, but it does make you wonder where this might lead. Increasingly, what we see is that different forces, political um, and economic, are making the internet less free than we had hoped. The United States government and other governments are going to platforms like Twitter and Facebook and asking them, what are you going to do about this jihadist speech? What are you going to do to limit it? And are you going to help us get rid of it? And for people who are connecting, are you going to help us find out who's interested in this ideology? CNN breaking news. Breaking news this evening. Breaking news. The whistleblower revealed the 29-year-old who leaked those top secret details of the government's sweeping surveillance program is now come forward. Uh, my name's Ed Snow. Edward Snowden's infamous revelations set off a ripple effect that is still traveling throughout the digital world. Leaked documents suggested the NSA was tapping directly into the servers of firms like Google, Facebook, and Apple. By all appearances, it's a top secret program that's been going on for years. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. Snowden worked for the National Security Agency and leaked thousands of classified documents that revealed the government was collecting the communication records of perfectly average folks, people like you and me. They were, in essence, spying on millions of Americans. We caught up with him in Russia, where he is in exile. He says that we should consider how far the government will go with that information. One of the common questions that people have when they think about the surveillance problem, when they think about all of the data that's being collected by corporations and government, why do people get so angry when the spies are doing it, when the government is doing it? 
when they say they're trying to do it to, do, to save lives? The answer, as far as we can tell today, is that the participation with these private companies is largely voluntary. You're opting in to use Facebook. You're signing up for a Google account. You're agreeing to the terms of service on Twitter. And there's also a difference in the level of power that these different sets of actors can bring to bear. Google can spy on your email and serve you ads that they think are relevant to your interest. The government can put you in jail or drop a bomb on you. The revelations sparked by Edward Snowden and continuing through the last you know, several years, frankly, I think have reshaped the conversation in this country, certainly, and really around the world. We know that the internet and much of the digital world was an American invention. Once it went global, that meant to the rest of the world that the United States was holding the keys to cyberspace. But once the Snowden incident happened, things began to change. Non-Americans began not to trust us. They were concerned that Big Brother, or rather, Uncle Sam, was watching. Americans also did not want to accept that their technological life had to come at the price of possible surveillance. As a result, internet sovereignty is inching forward, where we may become a world where the web literally splinters along geographic boundaries, also known as the splinternet. One of the probably most compelling threats to a truly global internet right now are the calls for data localization and, and in-country servers and the application of one country's laws over another. Right now, we enjoy an internet that is a global network of people and institutions that we have come to rely on. It is open, flexible, and efficient. But if the internet becomes the splinternet, it would become a rigid system with impenetrable borders, and critics argue it would also lead to a system even more vulnerable to government abuse. Another online threat goes beyond invading your virtual space to actually invading your personal space. It's called swatting. It is an internet prank where someone finds out your home address and calls 911 to report a fake emergency. And just a few years ago, one went down in a suburb of Atlanta. It began with this 911 call. I was at work and I received a phone call from one of our caregivers and she said, something strange is going on. There's been some sort of 911 call, an emergency, and there's all of these police officers here at the house. It was early January 2014. It was about 420 something in the afternoon. My lieutenant came down the hallway and stuck his head in my door and he goes, hey, did you just hear that call? And he said, yeah, we got a person shot, at least two shot, and uh, a hostage situation. I mean, I really felt like, no, this can't really be happening, but when I could not reach anyone to get that reassurance, that's when it really just, you know, your head starts thinking crazy things. And, you know, what if there is some crazy person in my house? The end of my street had been barricaded, and there were helicopters all everywhere, and neighbors lined across. I mean, it's like something from a movie. I couldn't even believe what I was driving up to. I literally just stopped my car in the middle of the street and ran to a police officer that was standing there blocking the street. And I was like, this, this is my house, and my children are there, and I need to get there immediately. She is just absolutely beside herself, terrorized, thinking someone has been to her home and basically wiped out her entire family. We ended up 
you know, stopping her before she ran up to the house. I remember feeling like, I just want my kids. You know, I want my kids in my hands right now. After about a half hour or so, some things just weren't adding up. By this time, the media had already picked it up. And then all of a sudden, um, a nanny comes out, and she's got two, basically, naked children soaking wet because they were taking a bath at the time. Our patrol guys go in, and they clear the whole house. They come back out, and it's like, hey, man, nothing's going on in here. This is, this is a hoax. Their main goal is to try to elicit a large law enforcement response. Because even after it's done, they can come back and say to the person, hey, I reached out and got you today. I'll do it again to you tomorrow. Don't mess with me. Traditionally, the online world from the very beginning, and the, uh, the world of games, was a boys club. And I think that combination of locker room, anything goes, boys club mores in the online world, combined with this nobody knows your name, you can be anonymous in a certain sense, you're not anonymous, but you are, that characterizes cyberbullying. It's just a sick game. It's a kind of a retaliatory action. I'm not sure exactly what causes it to reach to a level of where you get swatted. Um, but that was my understanding. It angers you to know that somebody did this as a joke and that there's somewhere they're laughing about that and they thought that that was funny. There's no accountability. It's like a wild, wild west on the internet and every now and then a marshal will ride through town and bring some law and order, but then he leaves and everything goes right back to the same way it was. It can seem chaotic and lawless, but we can't really blame the internet for the malicious behavior of its users. That's the thing, we brought with us all of our social values onto the internet. It's not that the internet changed our social values, it, it reflects them. The global internet is so infinitely accessible, bad actors can show up anywhere. As for the technology itself, it's always been content neutral. The network never knew anything about what was being carried. Sort of like cars going down the road, you don't know what's inside. All you know is there's a road and a car and somebody driving. Check out this new app. It's called Invisible Girlfriend, and it allows you to build your ideal partner virtually. As the site says, it offers social proof. You know, like if you're not in a relationship, but you want people to think you are, now, don't get the wrong idea. I am very happy with my actual real-life girlfriend, but I thought I should investigate this to see what the future may hold. So first, you set up your own profile, and then you get to pick her traits. Her name? Let's go with Katie. Now, what is she like? Personality traits. How about lovingly nerdy? And what sort of stuff is she into? Ooh, chess. No, on second thought, no, let's not do chess. How about fashion? Yeah. Ooh, cooking. Yeah, that's a good one. And sports. Where do we meet? Hmm, camping. No. Uh, at the theater. You just finish it up here. And that's it. I now have an invisible girlfriend. Oh, look who it is. My new invisible girlfriend, Katie. Why would someone need a fake girlfriend? People aren't getting their emotional needs met online. They can find experiences elsewhere, but you may not get emotional support. There's, there's this real lack of empathy in the world. Meet the inventors of Invisible Girlfriend. This all started out as a, a crazy idea at a hackathon. It was a throwaway idea. He thought it was stupid. We formed a team, thought it would be fun to work on. What we wanted to do is just see if can we build something in a weekend. 
How soon could we get that working? Uh, always that question. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge was, how do we actually create a fake girlfriend or boyfriend? Starting out with a chat bot and then ended up going to real humans uh, because chat bots just don't work. So we, we built a very, very simple service. That simple service took off. OK, ready? Let's do it. Refresh. Three, two, one. Two hundred oh thousand and ten. Wow. That is awesome. Hundreds of thousands of people have signed up. Oh, you're too sweet to me. What are you planning on buying me? Wink face. Of course, I, I want to go out. I miss you so much. Meet an invisible girlfriend. She's a text writer for hire, and she does her best to make a virtual romance feel real. Actually, several at once. I'm usually jumping between a, a few conversations. Have you seen those videos of those parents that put toothpaste in Oreos and give them to their kids? This user says, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? And he says, when are we getting married? In a lot of ways, for the user, it is a real relationship. But some of them don't realize that they're talking to more than one person. It's true. The next text I get from Katie could actually be written by a completely different person. I like being the boyfriend because, like, I know what women want because I'm a woman. So, like, I know what a woman wants to hear, but I'm not necessarily sure that they'd be happy to know that I was a girl. Sometimes these quote-unquote relationships become a little complicated. Sometimes the users will try to take it to a sexting level, and you really have to deter them. But that doesn't happen very often. I think they just want someone to be kind to them. The user said, what I bought is a surprise, but I'll give it to you tonight when I pick you up for dinner. I love you, baby. And I said, I can't wait. I love you too, darling. You're too good to me. How do I deserve you? The creators of Invisible Girlfriend never expected it would become so meaningful to both parties. We've been really intrigued by how you can have a deep connection with just messaging alone. In the future, I think it's going to become normal to engage with characters that may not exist. With the web connecting more people than ever before, shouldn't we be able to have real human connections? But I guess that's the irony of the internet. The more connected we become technologically, the more isolated a lot of us seem to feel in our actual day-to-day -day lives. And that's, that's kind of sad. I hope that in the future we can still maintain those real person-to-person -person connections and we don't have to rely on computers to be our partners. Technology mirrors and magnifies the good, bad, and ugly of everyday life. For me, technology changes communication, of course. But is it for the worse? I'm not convinced at all. It's just different, and people learn how to move across these environments, and I'm confident that they'll figure it out. I think we have to start thinking about what technology we're going to build next. Um, the internet is changing in all kinds of ways. There's still a long runway for the internet and the internet community and civil society to realize the potential of the internet as the greatest kind of microphone for the individual ever created. I see virtual reality becoming a real thing, fully immersive virtual environments, haptic, you know, feedback, like you're there. Like you're in Tokyo, I'm in Miami, we meet in a virtual space that is like the matrix. I can touch you, I can hang out with you, we can adjust the lighting of the sky, we can cue the music to play. I mean, literally rendered dreamscapes, inception-like dream worlds that we can inhabit lucidly and navigate around in. I mean, literally, we all gonna move into a cosmos of the imagination. That type of immersion is gonna change things so fast, and it's here. The goggles are here, the bandwidth's here, the resolution's here. Sergio, let's just do a high five. 
Microsoft is developing a system that would make online interaction a lot more personal. We call this technology holoportation. With holoportation, people will transmit live holograms of themselves over the internet. Hi, Bob, I miss you. Hey, Lily, I miss you too. You coming home. The internet has become the main way we interact with others, real or imaginary, virtual or robotic. In the not-too-distant future, it could also transform how we interact with the dead. It's not hard to imagine that our loved ones who have passed on could be reconstructed by compiling their internet history. All their online activity, their email, photos, Facebook posts. Most people in the past lived and died with no record of their existence at all, other than their birth date and their death date. In the future, we'll have a library of souls. Now think of what you can do if you have the connect home. You would have a library of souls by which you could have a con an Einstein, a conversation with Winston Churchill. Of course, these figures died in the past, but in the future, the Einsteins and the Winston Churchills, their basic personalities will be preserved, and so you'll have a nice conversation with them. The future will lead us even deeper into virtual intimacy capitalizing on giving the user access to all the senses and catapulting us beyond the simple transmission of words and sounds to the sensation of human touch. There's already a virtual reality suit that can deliver a <laughs> hug. That's so cool. <laughs> and taking things a step further, researchers have reportedly proven that simple thoughts can be sent across the web. One subject in India with a computer sensor attached to his scalp merely thought the words hola and ciao. 5,000 miles away in France, another researcher, also wired up, received the brainwaves and found himself thinking the words hola and ciao. There will come a time when you don't actually have to tell anyone your feelings. They will be able to pluck them right out of your head. And on the horizon, the very essence of connectivity, the creation of a truly global village. Right now, only 40% of the world's population even have access to the web. A look at how many devices are actually connected to the internet, and you see how many of us are still in digital darkness. The barriers to connecting all of us are enormous. Money, language, infrastructure. We're gonna put power on now, okay? All together! Launching. In three, two, one. Come on. But Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg just recently launched what may be our biggest hope into the horizon with the test flight of Aquila. Aquila is a solar powered drone, and once she is launched, she should be able to fly for up to months at a time blanketing the most remote parts of the world with Wi-Fi. This is not the final frontier. The mobile device you have will be supplanted by other things, I'm certain. The system will just be on all the time, waiting for us to ask a question or to ask for uh, an action to be taken. So the way to think about where the Internet is going is...